All right, folks, we're going to get into our spotlight talks. Uh, our, uh, and it is luckily that our first spotlight talk is actually a pre-recorded talk, and then the subsequent ones will be live and in person. So our first spotlight talk continues on space activities and space resources. It is by Professor Stephen Freeland, and they'll be bringing up the video in just a second. So I will introduce Professor Stephen Freeland, which some of you, some of you may be familiar with that name. And actually, on the last panel, we were talking about the uh, UN Working Group on Space Resources. Uh, Stephen Freeland is, is one of those known names. Uh, he is the Emer Emeritus Professor of International Law at Western Sydney University. He is the previous Dean of Western Sydney School of Law. And he is a professorial fellow at Bond University. He represents the Australian government at the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, or COPUS. And in June of last year, he was appointed as the vice chair of a five-year COPUS working group on legal aspects of space resource activities. So we'll be showing uh, his video, uh, his spotlight talk, uh, in just a moment. Or I can stall for time. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Stephen Freeland. I'm speaking to you from Australia. I'm really sorry I can't be there in London, but um, I'm sure the uh, summit is going brilliantly. Uh, many thanks to the Secure World Foundation and the UK Space Agency for inviting me. Um, I'm a uh, Emeritus Professor at Western Sydney University and a Professorial Fellow at Bond University and a Principal of a law firm called Azimuth Advisory. Um, I also have the honour of being the co-chair of the uh, United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space Working Group on Legal Aspects of Space Resource Activities. And so I'll be talking to you today about space resource activities in the brief time. The where why and how. Obviously, um, this is a complex issue and there are many uh, challenges, there are many opportunities. And so briefly, let me take you through some of the dimensions and then leave you with, if you like, some of the burning questions. Most of you in the audience, I assume, would be aware that there's an incredibly revitalized interest in the notion of uh, exploiting the natural resources of celestial bodies in space, be they on the moon perhaps, be they on asteroids, comets, Mars, or whatever. Um, for some, this is uh, an incredible economic opportunity. For some, this is uh, highly strategic, highly political. It's about science. There are environmental issues at stake, of course. It's about national pride. It's about co cooperation. It's about geopolitics. It's really about our relationship with space. If space resource activities and the exploitation of those resources are to be done in the way that industry is projecting, and of course there are a lot of issues before that, then it may redefine the way we look at space. It's been addressed as being uh, an opportunity for humanity, both from an environmental viewpoint and a science viewpoint, but also to aid missions um, in the development of a cislunar economy and cislunar technology that would allow for countries to utilize these resources for their further space missions. So in that respect, it's been um, projected as giving great benefits to humanity. Others, of course, see risks associated with a land grab, with environmental degradation, with uh, the dollar sign being the overarching uh, incentive above everything else, and worse still, the notion of misunderstandings and conflicts. So there are opportunities, but there are also risks. The opportunities, I think, are that this is one of these big issues in space. And if, and it's a big if, if we can get the technology right, if we can get the geopolitics right, if we can get the commercial business case right, if we can understand all of the really, really complex issues on a wide scale, 
And if we can successfully do this in a safe, sustainable way, then that would be a great of great benefit for us all. However, we're already seeing in this difficult geopolitical world that different groups of countries have different ambitions. Of course, we're all aware, for example, of the Artemis Accords. And as I speak, we've just had France become a signatory to the Artemis Accords, bringing the number to 20. So there are 20 countries who have signed up to these political agreements about governance of activities, not only on the moon, but on these celestial bodies, not only about resources, but certainly involving resources. But we have ambitions of other countries, China and Russia have a joint venture, although obviously in the current circumstances uh, that may be on hold. But India, well, and so with the big issues, my own view is that we need to find a way that all of the major players can and will uh, agree to the rules of the road so that they can all coexist in one sense and undertake their activities, not necessarily totally in cooperation, but at least by the same rule book. And I think that's a really important process. And so this matter um, has been, of course, the subject of much work at civil society level. There's, we've had domestic legislation in many countries, but it's also being discussed at the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Uh, for those that don't know, this is a United Nations body established in 1959. It has, um, at present 100 member states, which includes virtually all of the spacefaring countries, and it's growing very quickly and very significantly. And it's the major uh, international fora that deals with uh, the governance structure and the scientific issues around space. They have established a working group. As I said, I have the honour of being the co-chair of that working group. Uh, the working group, as I said, is called Working Group on the legal aspects of space resource activities. Um, a working group essentially is a modus operandi for COPOS. So initially they decide that an issue is of interest and they put it as an agenda item for discussion. So to move it from a discussion point to in a sense, an action item uh, where you have a goal oriented uh, um, set of uh, specific mandates you establish a working group. But the working group is not three or four people, it's the 100 countries. We have agreed our mandate and the um, possible outcomes of our five-year working group. I've got the UN documents there, but essentially uh, there's an, obviously an incredible amount of information that needs to be gathered. Then there will be a study of the existing legal framework that will clearly involve uh, the treaty framework and perhaps some other instruments. Um, to see whether, and if so, how, and to what extent they might be relevant for these activities. Then there will be an analysis of whether there are benefits in developing a further framework specifically for space resource activities. There will be the development of a set of principles, practical principles, uh, that would allow for such activities to be undertaken in a safe, sustainable and rational way. And then there will be an analysis of where to from here. So by the end of five years, we'll be at that point where we have all this information, all this analysis, a determination of where we need to go and whether we need to establish a legal model for these sorts of activities. And if so, what sort of framework that might cover. And so uh, the member states at that time will decide where to move on. But if there's a consensus agreement that this is an important issue, then they may decide to extend our working group. Now, this is an intergovernmental process. I have to stress that. The decisions will be made by the member states, but there are still broad opportunities for the, the wider stakeholders, and there are many, because as I say here, we need to understand the questions before we can consider the answers. And so what are the major questions that need to be asked? Uh, they're on the next slide. 
uh, to come. But essentially, we need to determine what are the resources we're looking at. And there's been lots of discussion about not only water, but uh, so, uh, some, some heavy minerals and some rare earth minerals and other things. What sort of activities will be covered? What sort of information do we need? How does the existing framework work? Um, how is it implemented? What do we need to do in the future? We will have opportunities for non-governmental stakeholders to participate, notwithstanding this is an intergovernmental process through a dedicated conference, and we may be establishing some other processes as well. And so I urge all of um, you listening, if you have an interest in this, please follow our work, please look at the documents, please study our mandate, please participate in the processes that we will be establishing, because really this is an issue that is so complex that we need to have um, as much detailed information on the technical, scientific, cultural, environmental, economic, and other aspects of this before we can make appropriate decisions, before the member states can make appropriate decisions as to the way forward, so as to maximize benefits and minimize risks. So I'm sorry this has been so rushed. Um, if you're interested, please contact me. Uh, my details are on the screen. I wish you well for the rest of the summit and thank you for listening and uh, all the best from Sydney. Thank you again. All right, the next spotlight talk will be given by Florian Miko and Adrian Sada, which I see over there. I'll introduce them. Florian Miko is a uh, project manager for the Space Sustainability Rating, the SSR, at the EPFL Space Center in Lausanne, Switzerland. And his colleague, Adrian Sada, is the operation officer for the Space Sustainability Rating. Mr. Miko and Mr. Sada, you have the floor. for joining this uh, spotlight talk. We are very excited today because it's the, uh, the launch of the, of the space security rating, uh, as you may have already uh, uh, know uh, since this morning. Um, so basically, um, we'd like to also start by thanking again the Secure Foundation for this opportunity. And uh, we, we could have, uh, have no hoped for better conditions uh, to, to launch uh, this project that we spent a lot of effort on uh, with, with the members of the consortium. So, oops, sorry. So the SSR team, um, the SSR is currently hosted by the eSpace, uh, EPFL Space Center in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, it's, a, it's a research institute spearheaded by Professor Jean-Paul Neb, and myself, uh, Florian and Adrien, are working full-time on the project, implementing the vision that we, uh, we were given by, by the consortium. So now let's, let's, let's focus on what matters. Basically, the, the space sustainability rating is a new and innovative way to incentivize safer conditions for operating in space. And this is done through uh, a rating system, which is uh, informed by, by a transparent and data-based assessments, which are aiming to quantify precisely uh, uh, the sustainability impact of a mission in the space environment. And this is done, I should emphasize, because it's a very important point uh, uh, for operators, is that we are not disclosing any uh, proprietary information or mission-sensitive data. So anything that is done when we perform a rating is done with us, the SSR team, and the operator. So basically, it covers all the phases of a mission, and my colleague Adrien will uh, present you uh, more in detail the technical aspects of the rating, but our goal is to pretty much encourage all the space operators to integrate this sustainability mindset and also to walk the talk. So once, for instance, you, you are issued a rating, we also want to, uh, you know, through a very intense uh, and thorough uh, verification process, also make sure that in the long term, your mission is sustainable. So this is why we are also aiming to develop a certification system, which is based on the rating system. So just a few words about the timeline. So everything started back in 2016 with the World Economic Forum Global uh, Council for Space um, to, to address the question of space debris. They uh, wanted to explore the possibility of developing a rating. And after two years, they appointed a consortium of four organizations, including Brystec, the European Space Agency, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and the University of Texas at Austin, 
which developed the methodology. And uh, to this day, the consortium remain highly active uh, in the development and implementation phase of the rating. And you may, uh, we have introduced this morning uh, the SSA ambassadors, and we have the pleasure to see them again uh, uh, today with us. And um, then we have been appointed with the space to lead the implementation phase of the rating. And over the past uh, month, we have led uh, some beta testing and we also developed the platform uh, for, for reporting uh, the data. And of course, we have also been looking to develop this partnership because we think that when it comes to space sustainability, the space sustainability rating will not achieve this by itself. It needs to foster collaboration. And then uh, we also spend a lot of time on, in business planning. So we have this idea, uh, but we are a non-for-profit uh, organization. And this is done mainly to ensure the transparency and the fairness of, of the rating. And in the future, also, uh, this is a very important message that we would like to showcase today, is that the rating will continuously evolve in the future to reflect the new trends and as long as we advance on the research on space sustainability. And this is what we are trying to do. We are trying to set a, a, a movement towards more and more sustainability in space. And I should also, if the next slide is coming, sorry. Yes, just to, to showcase that there's been a lot of interest over the past years in the rating. And we already have, uh, we already, already benefit from the support of many organizations as member of the SSA Association. And in the future, in the coming, uh, in the coming years, we would like to, of course, engage with not only operators, but all the organizations that have an interest in space. So this is why we have also this association in place. And uh, if you are interested, we will uh, let you know more about how you can get involved in a few minutes. But now we'll hand over to my colleague, Adrien, who will take over and get, get you through the technical aspects of the rating. So thank you very much, Florian. Uh, we'll guide you through rapidly of what are the modules that are composing the space sustainability rating. So first, the space sustainability rating is a point-based system where operators can get points by uh, complying to some um, questionnaires or achieving great results in uh, simulation that I will present. So the first module is the mission index and uh, was developed by the European Space Agency and quantifies and measures um, the level of physical interferences uh, that are um, caused by the planned design and operation of a mission. So it is basically measuring the environmental impact on the space environment um, that is caused by, by the mission, taking into account the number of satellites, for instance, the orbits, but also the post-mission disposal success rate and collision avoidance strategy. So we could talk for hours about this module, but there are papers that uh, describe well better that I, I, that I will do. Uh, you can also find more details on the website of the SSR. So the second module is also a simulation-based module, uh, was developed by the uh, UT Austin and the MIT. And um, ask this question. So if an operator sends a satellite, is it possible to detect it and track it? Um, so how it is computed is that uh, a ground sensor network is simulated, uh, both radar and optical, and then from the physical attributes of the satellites, um, this module is assessing to which extent um, a satellite can be, can be detected and tracked. The third module of the SSR uh, is a questionnaire-based module and assess um, not the, the risk prediction achieved by the collision avoidance strategy, but whether uh, if the operators has the capability and the availability to perform collision avoidance maneuver and uh, reward operators that has taken time to actually be prepared for this kind of situation. So this is achieved by, uh, for instance, having a good orbital state knowledge of the satellite, uh, being available in a short time to, uh, um, to be able to perform collision avoidance maneuver and have the, the staff trained in order to perform these maneuvers. The next module is data sharing. So data sharing is very important, and uh, we've seen it through uh, previous events, so Kinetic Space Safety Workshop. Even yesterday, we talked about data sharing and transparency. So the SSR is taking into account which information you share and to which stakeholder you share this information. So if it's shared with SSA provider, other, um, other operators, or to the public. The fifth module is application of design and operation standards, and um, basically evaluates to which extent uh, the space debris mitigation guidelines and other uh, standardization guidelines are followed by the operator. And finally, the last uh, module of the SSR is external services uh, and is only intended as a bonus. 
um, but intends to reward operators whose mission is compatible with future on-orbit servicing on active debris removal, for instance. Now, each of these modules have a score, and then from this score, uh, a normalization is done for the two simulation-based module, and from there, we proceed to a data verification. So meaning that uh, we check whether the applicant only has an assertion or if there are technical uh, documentation to support it, if there is a third-party authority that is also verifying it. And from there, um, the final score of the module is given, and from, uh, a weight is applied on it, on, and uh, the final score uh, can be aggregated from this final score, a different rating levels can be achieved. So uh, the first one being bronze, silver, gold, or platinum. And then from there, there is also a second part of the rating which rewards uh, better than expected behaviors uh, by the means of honorable mention of a bonus star. So meaning that there can be one, two, or three bonus stars. Okay, so from there, from there, um, what we performed this one year was that we performed beta testings with operators, and as you can see, there's uh, different types of operators. There's CubeSats, EPFR spacecraft team, there's uh, constellation of small satellites, Earth observation satellite, and maybe I should mention that here, there's, there's one logo missing, but we also beta tested with uh, one web. I should mention that it's missing on the slide, sorry. And after the, the aggregation into a single score, uh, what we really emphasize is the fact that it's not only get a rating and it's done, uh, we also proceed to a feedback loop. We do um, a report on uh, where the mission score high, where the mission score low and why, and provide recommendations so that the operators can also improve and on the long term be more sustainable. So I will lead back the floor to Florian. Thank you. Thank you, Adrien, and this is the last slide. Um, just to let you know, so we are here for uh, one thing, we want you on board. So this is why there's two ways uh, to get engaged with the SSR. The first one is to perform a rating. So for that, we have developed a, um, a subscription system whereby operators can, uh, can, can come to us and then we can provide uh, them with up to 10 ratings. But as Adrian mentioned, there's a part that is very important. It's not only that you will perform a rating, but the team will be there as well to assist you in identifying areas for improvement and then it will be up to you to deliver positive change uh, in outer space. The second part is that, as I mentioned, we are an association. We not only provide these ratings, but we will also want to work with all the organizations with an interest in space. So this is why with the association, we will be setting up working groups centered on the rating, also on policy, because policy is an important component of space sustainability, and as well on the certification system that we're going to develop. And you will have these opportunities to engage with us if you got on board. So we, we hope that you will join us in this journey, and we look forward to, 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 uh, for you to get in touch with us and reply any of your questions that you may have. And that's it for us. So you can get in touch uh, uh, through the, our email address. You can also visit our website, which, uh, which has gone live today. And of course, we are, uh, we are on social media. And we'll be grateful to, to hear from you very soon. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Our next Spotlight talk will be by Professor Lucy Green. Professor Lucy Green is a professor of physics at the University College London and a Royal Society uh, University Research Fellow based at the Mullard Space Science Laboratory. She sits on the advisory board of the Science Museum, is chair of governors of the UCL, UCL Academy, and is chief stargazer at the Society for Popular Astronomy. Professor Green, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So it falls to me to um, give an academic's perspective on space weather and linking that then to satellite operations. So as you've heard, I work at UCL. I'm a space scientist there, and um, my interest is in studying the sun, which is the source of space weather. So I couldn't um, start the talk by um, not showing a movie of the sun to sort of give us some context. So this is one of the great discoveries of the early space age, of course, is that when spacecraft were launched beyond the Earth, beyond the Earth's magnetic field, it was realized that the space around the planets um, is not empty and that we have this kind of profound and intimate relationship with our sun in that the sun is always ejecting material out into the solar system. And I'm sure you, or everybody in this room is familiar with that. So the movie that's running here is real data collected from the SOHO satellite 
it shows us the atmosphere of the sun, in, um, it just illustrated in green, and then this kind of constant outflow of material um, that is taking place from our sun. So we have um, energetic events called solar flares that emit high energy radiation, and in fact, electromagnetic um, um, radiation across the electromagnetic spectrum. We have um, particle events which appear like this. Actually, this move is not showing very well, um, but you can see that kind of snowstorm that falls on the detector. So in addition to those two forms of solar activity, we also have the kind of bulk eruption of magnetized plasma that gets given the rather um, awful name, a coronal mass ejection. But you might see these kind of phrases appearing in the media. The media love to cover solar activity and tell us that it is going to wipe out all our technology. That is not, of course, as you know, um, <laughs> realistic, but the sun does have a significant impact on us. So what we tend to do in um, terms of sort of studying solar activity is split them into these three forms that I've mentioned already. So we have these eruptions from the sun that take anywhere from between um, one to four days to transit that distance between the sun and the earth. We have the energetic particles, which are high energy electrons and protons that take maybe between 40 minutes or around 40 minutes to get from the sun to the earth. And then we have the solar flares, which are these bright flashes of, um, of, of light that, I mean, when we see them <laughs> is, is when they arrive. So that light takes eight minutes to get to the earth. And there is a significant amount of research all around the world that looks at understanding these forms of solar activity and understanding the impact that they have on the near earth environment. So sometimes you'll see these um, impacts talked about, sort of um, categorized by these different events. And what I've tried to summarize here is, is some of those impacts. So when it comes to these ejections, when they reach the Earth, they interact with the Earth's magnetic field and they disturb it. And that then has knock-on consequences on the radiation environment that satellites then um, um, experience. So it may be that there are um, increased numbers of electrons around the spacecraft um, that lead to surface charging, there might be high energy particles being accelerated down, but also changes to the atmosphere can occur as well that then impact on the propagation of the signals between the spacecraft and the ground stations. Um, energetic particles are of significant importance to satellites in higher altitude orbits, and they can cause, um, I they, they act as ionizing radiation, causing damage to, um, to the satellites. And then with solar flares, their energy is deposited in the atmosphere of the Earth, which causes it to heat and expand, and you can get increased satellite drag, um, as well as other problems as well. So there is a kind of multitude of ways in which the space changes to the space environment can have negative impact on your spacecraft. And <laughs> any of these events can happen um, either individually or they can happen in the largest events all together. So you could have, you know, your large solar flare going off and your radiation received at the Earth. You could have, uh, affecting the, the daylight side of the Earth, you could then have 40 minutes later your energetic particles arriving, which can have a global consequence, and then a day later, two days later, your um, eruption arriving at the Earth that can then have um, prolonged changes to the Earth's magnetic field and its atmosphere. So... Um, <laughs> One of the challenges that you know people like myself have to deal with is is is, is to then take this data, take this this the um, the knowledge that we're gaining, and try and translate it into something that's useful for society. And so the size and complexity is a challenge. I've sort of tried to illustrate. So we have the sun, you know, our local star, very large, sitting in the centre of, of the solar system that we're trying to monitor and characterise and understand the physics of. The radiation, the emissions that the sun produces, then propagates 150 million kilometres through the solar system, evolving and changing over time as it goes. And we want then to characterise those emissions and understand which bit of it is going to be the bit that arrives at the Earth and has the impact for us. Um, and then when it arrives at the Earth, we've got to try and characterise the changes that take place in its magnetic field and its, um, and its atmosphere. And those impacts can be varied. So within the UK and around the world, as I've already said, there are teams that are looking at understanding the physics, the complex physics across different size scales, different time scales that we want to fully understand. 
And the UK government at the moment is investing quite heavily in translating the physical knowledge that we um, are developing into a system of space weather forecasting. So we have this program called Swimmer, which is um, running at the moment, that's looking at, one of them is looking at um, high energy particles, um, understanding how we might better forecast the occurrence of those particles, and then another project looking at how the Earth's radiation base belts are responding to the um, changing solar activity as well. So then I think this is kind of my last slide, just to put some examples of impact to bring it back down to Earth. Um, as I said, I'm an academic, so I don't necessarily um, get access to the detailed satellite information that many people in this room might be, access, uh, might be able to access. But in terms of sort of significant events that have been experienced over the years that are talked about publicly, they're, they're fairly wide ranging. I think it's fair to say that the strong solar activity that took place in 1989 was kind of our wake-up call to space weather. It had a really strong effect on the ground through the loss of the um, Quebec uh, electricity distribution network, but th the effect was also felt by spacecraft as well. And we don't hear about that very much because, of course, at that time there weren't too many satellites operating. But one that's close to my heart, the Solar Maximum mission, dropped about five kilometres in altitude because of those increased drag um, forces experienced <coughs> as the atmosphere expanded. But there was loss of positional knowledge of about 1,000 space objects for um, around a week. Then coming further forward, 2003, the Halloween storms, another really significant time where there was a solar activity event after solar activity event that had significant impact on our satellites with about 10% experiencing anomalies. And then there have been some nice studies done in response to this kind of growing awareness of the impact of space weather on, on our satellite infrastructure. So one is done is carried out by the Royal Academy of Engineering, um, so I'd encourage you to have a look at that as well. So that was a very kind of whistle-stop tour, really, to sort of flag the research areas across the solar system that are being looked at. I'm sure many of you will know much more about the detailed impacts on the satellites than, than I do. Um, so just the sort of point to say that in academia, we are working to help support the forecasting and understand how we can mitigate the risks. And I've also got a last line, which is I haven't even talked about the ground station and the ground segment associated with satellites, which also is, of course, impacted by space weather. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right on time also. Our next speaker is Mark Boggett. Mark Boggett is the co-founder and CEO of Seraphim Space Fund. He has invested in a portfolio which includes three companies that have achieved billion dollar valuations. So Mr. Boggett, I see you and the floor is yours. Thank you and good afternoon everybody. Um, not quite as exciting as talking about um, ejections from the sun and uh, Halloween events, um, but I'm going to talk about um, ESG. And actually, I'm excited about ESG because I think it's really going to be, over the next few years, be increasingly important um, for the space sector. So um, ESG um, has been around for 20 years. It was actually developed by the United Nations and has been growing very rapidly over the last handful of years. And um, uh, what it is, is now become the number one priority for capital allocators around the world. So what are capital allocators? They, they are the pension funds, they're the, the endowments, they're the institutional investors. Importantly, they are the folks that give me, the venture capitalist, my money uh, to then be able to invest um, into your organisations. So what they care about, I care about. And then what I care about, you care about, because we push all of these regulations down um, to the portfolio companies that we invest into. And then those portfolio companies then push it down into their teams, into their customers, and it really starts to have an impact. So um, the societal and governance aspects of ESG are relatively straightforward to implement. And actually, I'm sure everyone will agree, in fact, we were talking about this over coffee, that particularly around diversity, there's been huge changes in recent years when we've had a focus on making sure that we've got the right gender balance and, and so on around board. So there's a huge amount of activity around that area, and ESG is, is very clearly working. My own organization, 50% female staff, uh, that's a very significant move from, from 10 years ago. 
However, the environmental side is really very difficult, and arguably this is one of the most important parts of ESG. And any reports that are done talking to investors about where they consider ESG to be valuable, it's all around the environmental aspects. And the problem is, it's difficult to measure these, it's difficult to, uh, to compare them side by side against different companies in the same sector, or even uh, different sectors against each other. So, so uh, there's a huge range of ESG strategies that are being targeted by investors. I've identified a, a, a few of them here. Um, so around using ESG to actually identify the best long-term risk-adjusted returns, that means using the ESG as a measure when you're doing the due diligence or from a top-down, trying to pick companies in sectors that have uh, particular strong ESG characteristics. The one I like best is the, uh, the best in class. So this is actually looking at um, ESG characteristics and the growth in those characteristics. So for example, if you were trying to choose between making an investment in BP and Shell, one of the reasons that you might invest in one or the other is because of its Im improving score within ESG. So it really is important. It really does um, uh, really, really move significant numbers. And as it says there, there's $30 trillion today of money that is identifying itself as ESG-focused money. So it's really important um, as, a, as, a, as an industry that we recognize that and we do what we can to support that. Now, as I said, I think that there's a huge opportunity for the space industry. Because the problem is that uh, around the measuring of the, the climate elements of ESG, it's really challenging to do. And yet the Earth observation market can start to provide this data to the world that requires this data now. And it importantly means that um, we're, we're no longer relying on uh, voluntary data from companies talking about how they're developing on the, e on the uh, environmental side. We can actually use real data. We don't need to wait for the companies to actually tell us their data. We can glean it ourselves, and then we can measure companies um, side by each other. We can look at different sectors, and we can then use that information to make further changes. So one of the big problems at the moment is this is still embryonic. It's still coming together. I mean, even the rating agencies can't agree. If you've got two different rating agencies rating the same company, they'd end up with completely different scores. We heard this morning the minister talking about how important this is and how actually the UK wants to take a leadership role in this area in creating a, a kite mark around uh, ESG and sustainability. Now, next of all, I'm going to talk more um, about my organisation, Seraphim. So I'll just start off with, uh, with, with our own strategy. So we look at the world um, uh, investing in space sustainability, uh, digital infrastructure for space, and then uh, climate-related um, opportunities. And we're filling out um, uh, those opportunities. So across my um, broader organization, we've invested into uh, 88 space companies around the world. You can see here that we've invested into some of the uh, leading space sustainability companies, the likes of Astroscale and Deorbit, Leo Labs and Privateer. So we've been invested in these businesses for years. We understand the importance of building uh, this capability uh, in order so that we can continue to then build out the infrastructure uh, as, we, as we are doing. Now, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was our, our own um, journey on uh, ESG. So ESG is very much a journey, um, and, uh, and we've just embarked on this ourselves. So I wanted to help you understand um, the process that we go through when we're evaluating companies. So first of all, um, we have a, um, a, a questionnaire that goes out to a company when we first engage with them. And what we're really trying to do is, with each of those companies, with each of those E, S, and G sections, there's about 30 questions that they need to complete that gives us a, a, an initial position of the uh, ESG position of that business. We don't expect any of the businesses to be amazing. We're not really qualifying the businesses based around where they are now. It's showing how we can actually help them move on all of those measures as time goes on, because actually how um, you improve from ESG measures is, is, is a really important thing to be able to measure. Now, the other thing that um, is, uh, is a key consideration for the space industry is that a lot of the companies that we look to invest into are inherently dual use. So uh, ESG investors, uh, in many cases, are, are looking to rule out certain areas, such as defense, so we need to be very careful that we're very clear about what the companies are doing that we're investing into. So we've de developed a very sophisticated tool that uh, encourages us to ask a whole series of questions. So we can ask, 
what's going to happen with this technology? What are the other use cases it could be used for? How can we protect against this technology being used in areas that are offensive, and weaponized, and used to, um, to, to damage humanity? So this is a, a key part of our process that we go through, and it's one of the things that um, our investors who are investing into Seraphim want to make sure that we've got robust processes and that there's actually no subjectivity in that. It's actually a process that comes out with an answer at the end. And this sometimes leads to us um, wanting to invest into a company, but before we do so, uh, requiring them to sign up to some sort of legal agreement that they won't take their technology down a particular path that could result in that solution being used for, for weaponizing or for, uh, for offensive purposes. Now, one of the things that, um, that we recognized around ESG is that really it's, it's about measuring, really looking at the past rather than the future. What it doesn't really capture is the impact. And so one of the things that we have developed because of the types of companies that we invest into, all space companies, these are hugely impactful companies. And the ESG framework doesn't actually provide a measure to measure how successful a portfolio company is against delivering against um, sustainability. So what we've done is we've, uh, we've developed a framework used in, using the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, all 17 of those goals. And whenever we invest into a portfolio company, we identify which, which of those SDGs that is relevant to that portfolio company, determine a methodology for how we can measure the impact against that SDG, and then we measure that on an annual basis. So that um, over a period of time, we're going to build up a significant body of evidence around our portfolio about how it's changing over time and actually the actual impact that that portfolio is having. So this is, um, this is my final slide, and it just shows um, a handful of our portfolio companies and just how we think about them and how we've categorized them. So ISI is one of our portfolio companies. It's the world's largest constellation of radar satellites. Radar satellites can be used for, for lots of applications, but one of the key applications that they are being used for at the moment is around uh, natural disaster monitoring, flooding, that type of thing. So it's really about climate action. So we are, we've got a, a range of measures that we're measuring that company so that in years to come, we can demonstrate exactly how that company has had an impact. AST is one of our portfolio companies that has cell towers in space, enabling to be able to communicate directly with any mobile phone with no hardware or software adjustment to that phone. Today, half the world is on uh, 5G, half the world is on 0G. And when those that don't have connectivity have access to it, that enables them to be able to access health, education, improve standards of living, and so on. So there are a number of measures that you can see there against SDG, the reduction of inequalities, the uh, creation of new infrastructure. And then, uh, Hawkeye, I'll talk about Spire finally. Um, uh, Spire is a, uh, a, a, an interesting business. It's, it's launched uh, more than 150 satellites that are the size of a shoebox. Each of those um, satellites has three elements to it, three payloads, one to collect weather data, one to track all of the ships on all of the oceans, and one to track all of the aeroplanes in all of our skies. So the, the data that comes from that is useful across a whole range of different measures, from agriculture through to um, being able to monitor ships and to um, set uh, courses for them to be more efficient in terms of the use of fuel or to avoid weather patterns and so on. So that's, uh, that's the end of my presentation. And hopefully, over the years, I'm, I'm looking forward to be able to use this body of information to really demonstrate just how impactful the space industry has been. Well, thank you. All right, thank you so much. And finally, we have Catherine Courtney. Catherine Courtney is, the, is a non-executive director, strategic advisor, and former CEO of the UK Space Agency. She chairs the Global Network for Sustainability in Space, which brings together scientists, industry, and policymakers in partnership to tackle the rising challenges of space debris and congestion. Catherine is also a STEM ambassador and a founder of PrimarySpace.org, which is a charity with a mission to inspire and engage as many primary school children and teachers as possible with STEAM subjects and careers. So, Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you, and I'm very conscious I'm standing between you and the break, so I shall try to beat time. Um, I just wanted to start by saying um, I was born, earlier today uh, somebody mentioned Valentina Tereskova. I was born the week that that 
first uh, female traveler into space, uh, left the planet and went into orbit. And so I am of that generation that witnessed the first space race, that uh, enjoyed the benefits of the, all the innovation that that first space race has driven for us. And the generation that um, has deposited all of the junk up there. I feel that as a generation, we have a responsibility and we have a critical role to play to change the way we treat the space environment. That's why all of you are here too. But I think more importantly, we have a responsibility to pass the baton to younger and more diverse leaders who are the people who are actually going to be able to come up with the technical solutions, the policy solutions, and forge the global consensus that's going to be required if we want space to be sustainable for future generations. So how do we do that? Well, I believe we need to engage young people at every stage of their learning journey and their early careers. Um, I think we need to make them aware of the issues. And I think we need to work to inspire them to get involved. Yesterday in this room, there was a whole group of young professionals and you could just feel the energy in the room, having those people gathered together. Those are the future leaders for sustainability of space. And that Gen Z group of people, they have superpowers that my generation don't have. They were born with a different mindset. They are globally connected citizens. Uh, already, you know, in their young lives. And they are known to be quite mission-led, mission-driven. So when we talk about ESG, actually, those people care about that. The young people in their early careers today, they want to work for companies who also care about that. So space sustainability is a mission that can really inspire them. Well, how do you support them to become the leaders? Find those people in your organization. Coach and mentor them and also get involved with those um, broader organizations that are bringing those voices into the room. Uh, the Space Generation Advisory Council. Last year I was contacted by um, the, the Y20 group, which is a group of young leaders from the G20 nations who write a communique uh, for the G20 leaders and um, with just a little bit of engagement with them, they were able to put space sustainability into their communique as a priority that they wanted to see the G20 leaders focus on. There's a group up in Scotland, as an example, called the New Voices in Space. They represent early careers people in the Scottish space industry who come from a very diverse uh, group, and they are very proactively trying to be role models for younger people. They advise the Senior Leadership Council in Scotland about uh, the strategy for Scotland. And I think that every Space Leadership Council around the world should have a group like that, that focuses on diversity and how you engage young people. Then, uh, if you go back a little bit earlier in people's learning journey, we have all the university students. We need more university students focusing on space sustainability as a career path that they would like to pursue, both from a science perspective that that's the area we want them to be putting their research efforts, but also um, to join business and bring their creativity to those businesses. Um, what can you do to support those people? Well, get to know your local university. Uh, reach out, sponsor degree programs. The Global Network on Sustainability in Space, which I chair, we've been able to uh, part fund three PhDs. We have uh, Luke Cornwell is here today doing fascinating work from the University of Kent find him and ask him about it. It's all about how to actually uh, identify this, th develop sensors that will identify those tiny pieces of debris that we cannot um, understand today. And so that's you know uh, the big mystery of the millions of pieces of, of tiny debris. You can do that too, actually. It's not that hard for a business to get engaged in supporting university students. There are the route maps and toolkits out there for internships, for apprenticeships. Um, and actually, there's in every country something like uh, the UK SEDS um, that we have here in the UK, which is a national association of students who are already interested in space. So let's get those students interested in sustainability and turn their uh, focus of attention to how they can play a role after they graduate. 
And then if we look at teenagers, we had people, panelists yesterday, talking about how do you engage teenagers? You know, if it's not on TikTok, then they're not going to be interested. But actually, teenagers are really important talent pool that we need to try and um, expand the number of high school and secondary school students who are interested in STEM subjects, and particularly from underrepresented groups. Um, and and uh, gender diversity is really important there. And what I would say is that in your organizations, you have lots of people who would make excellent STEM ambassadors. And we are lucky in the UK to have the STEM learning organization who help you figure out how to be a STEM ambassador. They can do your uh, checks, you know, your police checks, they can train you, and they can provide all kinds of opportunities for you to go into schools and uh, be that role model and, and engage those young people. You can also sponsor after school clubs for those people. And uh, you can join other campaigns like um, the WISE campaign in the UK is another great one. Women in Science and Engineering, it's, it doesn't take very much of your time, but as an organization, if you sign up and get involved, then you are inspiring lots of uh, young girls to think about what skills they could bring to a science and engineering career. And then near to my own heart, at primary school, elementary school level, actually this is where I feel we underserve you know, the audience, that what we have there is a group of people, there's a lot of research that shows that from the age of four or five, young people are starting to form all the ideas of what their possible futures could be. And some of those futures might not even be realistic, you know, they're gonna be a cyborg, robot, something, but actually, they are putting together a long list of possible futures for themselves. But if they've never heard of the sort of interesting jobs that people do in space sustainability, that's never going to make their long list, and so it is never going to make their short list as they go through their educational journey. So what we do with primary space is try to engage teachers and um, very young students with careers-related learning in a way that just opens up their eyes, particularly for underrepresented communities, again, who may have very low um, higher education participation, opens up their eyes and just introduces them to ideas that there are cool jobs that you can do in space. And they are really interested in sustainability of Earth, that age group. I know I have three at home. And they are, would, they are equally interested in sustainability of space if you can speak to them uh, in stories that make sense to them. So, to wrap up, I'm just going to say that actually building that talent pool, finding those future leaders and supporting them, it's not just for pushing forward the future leaders of sustainability of space. It's actually a benefit to the wider economy as well. Um, in the US, I was looking at recent statistics, there are uh, projected to be 3.5 million STEM jobs uh, by 2025. And where are those workers going to come from? The UK is estimated to lose more than 1.5 billion uh, per annum from its economy due to skills gaps, due to STEM skills gaps. So as the minister mentioned this morning, you know, being a science superpower nation, that needs a much larger and more diverse talent pool. So I'm going to talk not just to the people in the room, but to the 600 people registered for this conference on the, on the Whova app, right? It's down to you, actually. We can't all be Neil deGrasse Tysons, but as that PR panel yesterday said, everyone has a story to tell. Everyone has a story to tell. And your story is probably more interesting than you think it is. So you need to get out there. You need to share those stories. You need to be visible. And you need to talk about why, why sustaining space matters, why it matters to you and why it matters to all of us. So I challenge you to go home from this conference and find at least one younger person, one younger person that you can tell your story to and do as the, the late, great Stephen Hawking advises, which was to get them to look up at the stars and not down at their feet, wonder about why the universe exists, and be curious. Because if you can ignite that spark of curiosity for even just that one young person, you are starting to build that pipeline of future leaders who can deliver a more sustainable space for all future generations. I leave you with that challenge. <laughs>